Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. What you're about to experience is a free, worldwide interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to episode number 240 of Category 5 Technology Yay. TV. Now in full 3D. Oh, wait a minute. No. Oh, full that's, 3D? Am I poking you in the face? It's the chat room. Ah. Hey, Jameson was like, whoa, just popped right out there. <laughs> hey, everybody. Nice to see you. It's Tuesday, April the 24th, 2012. Hey, mm-hmm. Ray. Hello. Rachel Zhu joining us tonight. Robbie Ferguson. Hello. Good to see you. All righty, so let's see what's coming up in the newsroom. Google has plans to begin offering free storage in the cloud. <laughs> Don't do it again. <laughs> plans I to begin totally mining did, I asteroids didn't plan that. of their minerals have been emerging from the deaths of billionaire entrepreneurs. And we'll tell you what we know so far. An Xbox patent ruling favors Motorola over Microsoft. YouTube has a last court battle over music clips. So stick around, and we'll talk more about those later. Fantastic. Hey, I would love to receive your postcard. We've got a nice little stack growing, and uh, we love receiving your postcards from all over the world, so send one in. Category 5 Technology TV, P.O. Box 29009, Barrie, Ontario, Canada, L4N7W7. We'd love to receive your postcards. Please send us one this week. It would be awesome of you. Yeah, Category 5 TV is a member of the Tech Podcast Network, and if it's tech, it's here. Ooh. Speaking of the Tech Podcast Network, there is a show celebrating 200 episodes this week. Wow. It's the Geek Gamer Weekly. Geek Gamer? So that's like 200 weeks of doing Pretty Geek Gamer. Pretty impressive. So just want to say hey to Chase and uh, the team over there at Geek Gamer Weekly and uh, wish you a very big congratulations on your 200th episode uh, this week. So. Is it all just about geeky games? Is that what the, no, they, they talk not about geeky it or games, play them? But or geeks who game. <laughs> so it's like it's Unreal kind of Tournament stuff. and I don't know if they go that far back. More modern stuff and a little bit of kind of classic stuff as well. Definitely Tetris. Definitely Tetris. If you have not covered Tetris in your 200 episodes, my friends, it's time. (laughs) (laughs) So congratulations. You can check them out at geekgamer.tv. Lots of viewer questions have come in this week. We love receiving your uh, your viewer questions. And uh, thank you very much for sending them in. It's been really cool to have so many uh, questions to bounce around here at the studio. So thank you so much. Do you want to get into them or? Uh, well, yeah. Let's let's take one before we. Take All a righty. So this one is from Invincible Mutant. Hey, Invincible. It says Bef- before. I feel like I feel like I should say like, "How you been?" Like there should be witty banter off the top a little witty bit. Witty banter. Witty banter. Ha ha ha. Well, on the way here. Yeah. The guy pulled up in the car next to me, and I looked over, and I was like, "Whoa." He's got one scary Fabio? girl. Was it Fabio? <laughs> no, I thought he had a really scary, <laughs> hairy wife or child. Because it was raining, things were distorted. It was actually a Sasquatch. <laughs> it was a poodle in the passenger seat. Right. <laughs> but for a second, I'm like, whoa, buddy. <laughs> That's my pointless story for she you. She was looking at you and panting. It was really creepy. <laughs> oh, dear. That's on the way here, folks. <laughs> All right. Invincible's question. We can, uh, we can hit it. Yeah. All I'm, right. I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Yeah. It's been a, a fantastic <laughs> week. Yeah. Well, you look great. Oh, thanks. All righty. <laughs> so you drew my attention that you hid your IP address when browsing during this week's show. How did you do uh, that? And do you mind sharing? I reckon that you are not using any 3D <laughs> party proxy. And I reckon unsafe as my data will be routed to the proxy and the owner can do anything on the data unless it or analyze it or crack it. Something out of it. <laughs> All right, so yeah, well, a couple of weeks ago, I I was doing a demonstration, and I and I had blocked my IP, and yeah, I guess I should have been more clear that that was actually me circumventing the script's ability for me to uh, to to log my IP address. Mm. There are some services out there though. 
uh, um, that will allow you to. Yeah, he wanted you to show how you set that up, if possible. Well, it's it's actually it's actually irrelevant, Invincible Mutant. The and the reason is is because I was demonstrating a, a user script, and that script logs IP addresses, but I. And in the header of that script, I had access to the source, right? I just simply overwrote my IP with a bunch of zeros. So um, that was not legitimately, like I didn't have like a plugin in my browser that makes the server think that I'm 0.0.0.0. That's not possible um, because you have to have an IP address. It's just that in that script, I had tricked it. There is a service. I don't know if we can really um, say its name on a G-rated show. Hide my... <clears throat> The, it's a free web proxy that is going to allow you to basically browse the web um, hiding your donkey. <laughs> so you head over to Google, for example, and it gives you Google. I don't know if it will work. What is my IP? And Google gives me this IP address. So now if I do a lookup on that, who is dot sc slash IP address, Gives me, ah, uh, who am I today? Somebody in Toronto at 16 Creston Road. So just for an example, that's a, that's a uh, proxy, basically. So you put in a website and, and surf around. The good thing about that is it allows you to surf relatively anonymously. The bad thing is that you really shouldn't use that to, you know, the, the fear is, is or the, the concern is, is that that could be used to hack or exploit websites and things like that, um, which I, I don't recommend our viewers do, obviously. Um, and there's certain things as well, like pop-up blocking and things that, it depends on what you're doing and who you're visiting. If you visit our website, for example, and you're using a pop-up blocker or a, a, a private proxy, then it may limit your ability to support us with some of the things that pop up on the screen that are helping us to keep the show going. So, but that's that's one. Uh, uh, good guy says Ultra Surf is a popular proxy. Yeah, never used that one. And just seeing if I know off the top of my head anymore. Yeah, there's FreeProxyServer.ca is another one that uh, that exists out there. Another good one. Same sort of idea. Just a proxy server. So. So that's what that's really the only way that you can block your your IP address is by using a proxy. And if you don't have your own proxy server, then using one of those third party kind of proxies is the next best way to go. So and some of them also offer commercial services to allow you to VPN tunnel through their servers. So cool, cool. stuff. Yeah, we can't really get into what that can be used for, but I think you know. I think you know. Uh, Jameson says they're for paranoid people who intend to do bad things online. Usually, I mean, if you're going to use a proxy, I think IT will tell you, well, obviously you're doing something that you're not supposed to be doing. That's kind of what it boils down to. But sometimes there, uh, sometimes there's just annoyances on the internet. Like when I go so on... So what do you use it for? I use it for testing. Uh, when I need to test a website that I'm developing, and I need to test it from an outside IP address. Yeah. But where it can be handy too, I can't stand things like... Um, like when YouTube has a video that's only available in the UK, right? And it's like, oh my goodness. So you get on a UK proxy and then you can see that video and you're probably not supposed to do that. But that's really what people will use a proxy for, being able to access content that's geolocated uh, in such a way that you're not allowed to view it locally. So... So now you can IP. watch Epic Meals from any country. Epic Meal Time globally. I don't think that they would block it. Our show's available globally unless you locally. I know uh, they had set up a block in China to to block our our blip.tv server and stuff, and and so hopefully we're available everywhere. But uh, we certainly try to make it available everywhere. So, but proxies can sometimes be necessary. Get any new postcards this week? Oh, I just realized you you just learned a whole nother level of proxying. Did I learn it? She didn't learn Did it. I she has no it? idea what we just said. I get it. Yeah. This much of it. <laughs> didn't receive any postcards this week. Aww. Loved you though. I know, I know. 
Hey, we, uh, we've got to take a quick break, break Rachel. And uh, for you, stick around in our chat room. Don't forget, we've got some Eco Alkalines batteries, a full year supply uh, that we are going to be uh, giving away next week. And tonight, uh, this week is your last chance to qualify. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that. And uh, we've got your viewer questions and lots of great features coming up tonight. We're going to be looking at TinEye versus Google. We're going to be looking at a uh, service that allows you to send emails into the future. And we're going to be looking at Instagram and seeing if we want to love it or leave it. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. At EcoAlkalines, we believe you should be able to trust your batteries not just here, but here, here, and here. But with one exception, you should also be able to trust your batteries here. EcoAlkalines are the world's first and only certified carbon neutral battery manufactured to the highest standards of recycling and quality without any trace amounts of harmful chemicals like mercury, lead or cadmium. EcoAlkalines provide performance that rivals leading national alkaline battery brands at a comparable price. Find out more about the EcoAlkalines difference. EcoAlkalines.com this is Category 5 Technology TV, and as I was saying a little bit earlier in the show, we have a year supply of these EcoAlkalines batteries to give away, and these are going to be awarded next week. They're fantastic batteries. They are Half in a year supply. Uh, oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> there they go, folks. So, you, see, you got to be quick. you got to be quick. Qualify for this stuff, yo. All right. <laughs> EcoAlkalines are the world's first and only certified carbon neutral batteries. We'll just tuck you right back in there. All right. And uh, we would love to send you a year supply to help you make it seem like Earth Day all year round uh, because you'll be able to use batteries that are carbon neutral, 98% recyclable, manufactured with as many recycled components as possible, and they are carbon neutral. So uh, I'm going to show you how you can actually qualify for that. If you have Twitter, what you want to do is you want to get over to twitter.com slash category 5 TV. When you're there, you may have to scroll down if you're doing this later in the week. You're going to see the instructions here. Follow EcoAlkalines and then RT this for your chance to win a year supply of eco-friendly batteries. So all you got to do is bring up EcoAlkalines, follow them, and then retweet this message from Category 5 Tech TV. All right, and that is Category 5 TV on Twitter. Um, good guy wants to know how are rechargeable batteries versus eco alkaline. Rechargeable batteries contain heavy metals, chemicals within them that are not considered environmentally friendly. They don't break down in the dump, uh, and of course you want to send batteries to the to recycling facilities anyways. But fact is, truth is, it doesn't always happen. And so the goal has got to be to nip it in the bud and say, okay, here's a product that if it does make its way to the landfill, it's going to break down. It's going to leak no chemicals into the earth, and it's not going to cause any kind of detrimental environmental impact. Rechargeable batteries are terrible as far as heavy metals go. Very, very uh, bad for the environment when they do break down because they leak out those chemicals. So mercury, cadmium, lead, uh, different kinds of things like that that are very, very bad for the environment. So And he would know because he's an android, so he uses lots of batteries. I am an android. Okay, so if you're not on Twitter, that's how you get involved if you're on Twitter. Let's jump over to Facebook. We'll call it Bookface tonight. Jump on over to Facebook. Log yourself in. I'm going to do that right now. Once you're logged in, here's the website you need to go to. Cat5.tv slash eco. E-C-O. When you go there, it's going to, that's a short link. It's going to take you right over to Eco Alkaline's batteries. Here's their Facebook profile. Click on like, which I've obviously already done, and or click on, now here's what you've got to do. Okay, so you've liked them. That's step one. Now click to bring up their profile, and you'll see that Robbie Ferguson here has, again, it may be moved down the list if you're coming in later in the week. You want to bring up this uh, post that I've created here that tells a little bit about the contest, and you need to like that particular post. There's the like button down here. You can comment on it, whatever you need to do. 
the whole idea is we want to get you involved with this uh, Eco Alkalines and, and like them on Facebook, like the tweet, uh, or like the uh, my post there as well. And that let, lets other people that, uh, that are friends with you know that uh, Eco Alkalines is out there. And that's really what we want to do is uh, just kind of raise some awareness about this product. It's fantastic. It's environmentally f- uh, sound. It's eco-friendly. And uh, that's really important to us here at Category 5 TV. So, again, a year supply of Eco Alkalines batteries is uh, just waiting for you. And we're going to do a draw uh, next Tuesday night. And you're going to get your chance to, to win that. That's May 1st that we're going to be drawing those batteries. So don't miss out on your chance. All righty. All right. I'm just thinking, wouldn't it be funny if Jot won again? He wins every Hilarious. single contest. Hilarious. <sighs> <laughs> oh, Jot. <laughs> <sighs> well, time for some viewer questions. And, uh, Alrighty, so um, here's one from Dave Williams. Wanted to say oh, hey, thanks Dave. for your webcast of March 27th, which I had been able to watch episode 236 back in January when I was trying to understand how to use Wirecast. Oh, hey. Um, your tutorial was excellent and really would be valuable to anyone trying to evaluate the power of Wirecast software to stream a webcast. Um, let's see. It's also great to see a fellow Canadian with Wirecast expertise. I'm in Oakville and obviously not far from you and Barry. You appear to be interested in helping others, and so I hope it's not appropriate, inappropriate to ask a question. <laughs> of um, course. That's, uh, that's the idea. So he's been streaming in a 4.3 <laughs> format and have found my background graphic JPEGs to work well if they've been sized okay. to 720 by 540 pixels. Okay. I would like... I would now like to experiment with a Wirecast canvas format of 16.9 and just can't seem to resize my JPEG background graphics properly. I've tried 720 by 405 and 800 by 450, but I just don't get the same image quality as I do when I use 720 by 540 with a 4.3 canvas. Hmm. Do you have a recommended size of JPEG that you use effectively for shot backgrounds? Thanks for any assistance you are willing to offer. Okay. So... Dave, we are going to step into some Wirecast magic without actually touching Wirecast tonight in that case, uh, and just help you a little bit with image manipulation. What's the one thing that's true about taking a small graphic and making it bigger? It pixelates it. It pixelates. What does that mean? It means that it takes the, the pixels, the individual dots that comprise that image, and it stretches those pixels so they become bigger, which inadvertently makes the image look blurry. It makes it look uh, lesser quality and uh, generally just makes it look bad. So 720 by 540 is what you're using right now, which is proportional to uh, a 4 over 3 image. Like if I go 1024, that is proportionally 768, which means it's, it's a perfect 4 over 3. So now you're taking that image and you're trying to make it into something that's going to scale to 16 over 9. What are the dimensions that he's using again there? Um, uh, Dave's email. He said he's using what he's using now or the ones he's tried. 7, 720 by... Oh, so you're scaling down. 720 by 405, but you're also going up to 800 by 450. So that, first of all, if we went up to 800, what are we doing? We're making it bigger. Right? It's now 800 by 600, and then we're going to bring it down to 450 to keep it over 16 over 9. So you're stretching up to do that. Now, if you're doing 720 by your uh, 405, I'm going to show you what's happening here. Let's start with, I suppose we're going to need a, an image to manipulate here so that, uh, so that we can show you here. Uh, I must have some desktop wallpaper, an embarrassing picture of Rachel somewhere. I do tend to hold on to those, by the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Unfortunately. Just in case they creep up in a show intro. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring up our website, cat- category5.tv. I'm going to bring up our photo gallery. And we're going to find one here that is going to work. So we're going to pretend that this is our background. What seems appropriate? There's, there's so many great images here. I don't even know what to use. We can use the site background from our website. Nice picture of Rachel. <laughs> All right, let's, let's say this is the picture that we want to use. Boy, 
boy, oh boy, Flickr makes it tough to get an image. Let's see. Copy link address. Is that going to give it to me? Yes. All right. Let's open that up into the GIMP. GNU image manipulation program. You can do this in Photoshop, whatever you want to do. Now, uh, that's 461 pixels. So I really I want to give you a good demonstration. I don't want to take a 461 pixel image and scale it up to, to do the demonstration because that kind of can confuse if you're unsure what it is that I'm actually doing. So let me hop onto my network here. It'd be helpful if I had the image that you're working with and then I could actually um, demonstrate with your actual image. So if you're joining us in the chat room, pop me an email live at category5.tv with a, an attachment of that image. I'd love to receive it. Uh, in the meantime, let's see what I do have. Live TV is the best Because you never know when you're going to have to find a picture I should have a picture on my desktop That I can <laughs> always use whenever I need it Alright the, the music stopped, but I still haven't found it Here we go Season 5 crew of Category 5 TV <laughs> Shush. <laughs> We're not showing some of the images where Robbie's just kind of getting set up and ready to go. All right, you keep that up, and I'll I'll make it tough on you. <laughs> All right, let's open that image and okay. We're almost to the point where we can demonstrate for you what's going on. Here we go. All right. So you've got an image that is 720 by 540. I've created a canvas here that's those dimensions exactly. So here we are, okay? So there is our canvas that's 720 by 540. So what happens here, Dave, when you change the proportions of this, so if I go 800 by 600, it's going to actually stretch that image up and now I don't know if you can tell but it's actually gotten a little bit blurry so undo that what you need to do is when you create your images you need to create them in the highest resolution as possible for your uh, for your system you're using wirecast so if you're doing 16 over 9 I recommend that you use uh, if you're gonna if you think you're never going to do um, 1080 then you can go with like uh, like just a 720 P file, but what I would do is I'd make a 1080p file. That would be my source because I'm going to then downscale. As Rachel was saying a little bit earlier, if you stretch up an image, you're going to lose quality. If you stretch down an image, it's not going to lose any quality. I'm going to use an extreme case scenario here for you, Dave, just to demonstrate what I mean by this. Let's say we're not dealing with a 720 pixel image. Let's make it severe so that it's a good demonstration so that you can really see the difference here. This image is 200 by 150. If I were to right click on that, scale the image up, and we're going to make that now 1920 by 1440. It's going to make that image as big as my canvas, what I've told it to make it, but now it looks absolutely terrible. And that's nothing to do with the subject matter. <laughs> Why, thank you. Yeah, no, it has nothing, <laughs> but it, it's unusable. Right, Because what I've done is I've taken a smaller image, I've scaled it up, I've made it bigger, and I've gone lossy. Instead, what you want to do is you always want to have a larger image than what you need and then always be able to go down. If it's proportional, you know that you're working in 16 over 9, so you know you can do 1920 by 1080 and it's going to be 16 over 9 file. So that's what I would do. So create a new file, file new, 1920 by 1080, that's 1080p, 16 over 9, okay? And that's going to be now your background. So within this file, if I paste my image, I see that, oh no, my image is not high enough resolution for 1080p. So in that case, you can either choose to use a 720p background, if you never will go over that, or get back to your source file, get the one that's huge, and paste that in. Because now it's full resolution. Okay, so now we'll scale that down to the 1080p layer. Boy, oh boy, dragging my mouse might be quicker. There we go. Okay. So now let's just say that's my image. Okay, so now I've got an image that is 1080p. So if I look at that in full resolution, 
there's no blur there whatsoever. Okay, that's only 60. There we go. Nice and clear, unlike when we scaled up from before. So you see the difference in clarity, right? So now, it, because you're going to be using a, let's say, a 720 output, or let's say you're broadcasting at a lower resolution, which you, you seem to be doing, you seem to be broadcasting with uh, like 800 by uh, whatever, or 720 by 405, for example. So you don't need to rescale your image because Wirecast will automatically scale that down to whatever you're broadcasting in. Right? You don't need to create the image exactly this, the same size because it is the exact same proportion. It's a 16 over 9 file. So I hope that that's, uh, that that's clear and that understandable. And, but essentially, when you've got a file that's bigger than what you need, as long as the proportions are, are right, now if I go, watch what happens here. We're going to create a 720 file, and it goes down to 4. Like, just to demonstrate, don't actually resize it, okay? Keep it at 1920 by 1080, because that's going to be higher quality that you can work with later. But just to demonstrate, now if I, if I scale that in Wirecast, there's what it looks like. And it's perfect. It's completely lossless because I've scaled down rather than scaling up. All right. So that's always the way that it works. You want to scale down. Cool. Gravy. Cool. Gravy. Mm. Mm. You know, got time for a real quick question just uh, just before we get into the news. But Dave, thank you for your question. I do hope that that helps. Um, and again, if you want to send it, if if it's unclear at all, send us the image, and I'll I'll show you. Alrighty, so we have one here that uh, says, what do you think of the idea of plugging in four thumb drives into a pogo plug and shipping it to a family member and ask them to just plug power and ethernet cable in? Would that be an any easy access, offsite, cheap cloud storage, or is there a better way to do it? Thank you, hmm. John. It's a smart idea. Uh, pogo plug is a device that allows you to create your own personal cloud by simply plugging it into the internet with your own hard drives. So unlike getting into cloud storage with Amazon or cloud storage with Google or cloud storage with Ubuntu One, you are actually housing the files. It's your cloud. So the files are on your device. So if you go to the Pogo plug and unplug your hard drive and plug that hard drive into your computer, the files are all there. But then you can take that Pogo plug, send it halfway across the world, connect it to an internet connection and plug that same hard drive in and you've got access to it anywhere in the world. So cool stuff. So yeah, if you take a couple of flash drives, if they're big enough, and stick them into the pogo plug, uh, you'd be able to uh, actually um, send that anywhere. What's up? Oh, Garby just says, uh, ask Robbie when he'll take the number one spot in Wet Pulse. Oh. What does that have to do with anything? Right I don't now? know, but he said ask. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so now that you know that she'll pretty much br break my train of thought no matter what, it's all good. No. Um, I thought you were done. Oh. It sounded right. Oh. Okay, Pogo Plugs. <laughs> That's Pogo what Pogo plugs. Plug is. Okay. So, <laughs> my friend John, if, if, you, if, you take, yeah, if you take that Pogo Plug and, uh, and put a couple of flash drives into it, send it to, to a family member's house, get them to plug it in, then you will have access to that Pogoplug if you already pre-configured it. Make sure you pre-configure it because you've got to be on the same network to set it up. So, uh, But then when you send it anywhere, as long as they've got high-speed internet, you would be able to access that. So very, very easy breezy to set it up. Keep in mind, if you're using flash drives, um, there's a couple things that I would make sure of. Plug each flash drive into your computer and give it a volume label because Pogoplug is going to interpret each drive by its volume label. So if I call it disk 1, disk 2, disk 3, disk 4, then I'm going to have access to those by those names on my Pogoplug. Uh, or in, if you install the driver in Windows, it'll be the P drive. Or if you mount it to your, your computer in Linux, it's going to be just whatever mount point you created. But then there will be disk 1, disk 2, disk 3, disk 4. So it makes it a little easier. So in similarly, if you buy four identical thumb drives and they're all stock labeled the same, then I don't know how Pogoplug would react to that because it uses the labels as the drive assignments. So, so make sure you label them, plug them in, set, set it up at home, and then mail it wherever you want, anywhere in the world, and connect it to a high-speed internet connection. You'll be able to access that data. Flash drives, um, it's not going to create a RAID on a pogo plug. So keep in mind, it's not going to create one volume. It will be as many volumes as drives there are. So if you have small flash drives, you're looking at, you know, if it's a four gig flash drive, you're looking at four times four, not 32. All right. So keep that in mind. So um, take a look, see how it goes. 
or 16, whatever. <laughs> anyway, yeah, sounds cool. Let us know how it goes. Ready for All the news? Right. She's I like, guess how many? So. Ho- I, I sense the impatience. It's like it's news time. It's seven thirty. No. It's seven thirty. Why are you still talking about pogo plug and all its awesomeness? <laughs> Rachel. No. Talk about the cloud. <laughs> all right. Google is expected to shortly launch a major new consumer service offering cloud-based storage for photos and other online content. The effort of Google Drive is likely to offer 5 gigabytes of free storage with more available with more available for a monthly fee. It would challenge services including Dropbox and Microsoft SkyDrive. Experts suggest it could also force rival Facebook to enter the cloud market. Mm. Nothing to say on that? Yeah, it would be interesting. Details have been emerging of the plan by billionaire entrepreneurs to mine asteroids for their resources. The multi-million dollar plan would use robotic spacecraft to squeeze chemical components of fuel and minerals such as platinum and gold out of the rocks. The founders include film director and explorer James Cameron as well as Google's chief executive Larry Page and its executive chairman Eric Smith. They even aim to create a fuel depot in space by 2020. Really? But with the cost of getting to space, getting it out, what yeah. is the price going to be for this stuff? That, that's what the argument is, and that's what people are saying, like, in reaction to the, to the news. And to that, I say they are billionaires. Realistically. No, but if they try to sell it, it'll be like, here's a little dot no, of gold for a million dollars. And that's what people are saying is, well, do you really think that you're going to get enough gold to pay for this venture? But really, do, is there not any... Is there nothing to be said for I guess excitement, bored. innovation, um, to use your money to, to do something for mankind? Like, is there nothing to be said they for that? They could give it to me. That's true. That's true. They'll if they got money to waste, send me some. To me, though, it seems like, I mean, big hypothetical. If I had that kind of money, I mean, we're talking billionaires, right? Would a multi-million dollar project not seem a little bit piddly as far as compared to what I'm actually making at that point? To the point where, okay, well, this is going to this is going to be the biggest step for mankind as far as getting into space and creating a, a project that's mining minerals from moving chunks of rock in space. Mm. But then again, we know how that goes. They're gonna. It's space, so we can just litter everywhere. You just, just try to build a Starship Enterprise. I you would, add the money. I have tried. Life-size model. I tried. Send I ran out space. of money when it got about this big. <laughs> and it, it never made of flew. Play-Doh? It was made of Play-Doh. <laughs> yeah. All right. Microsoft has <laughs> suffered a setback in a patent row over technologies using its Xbox 360 games console. The claims relate to technologies involved in the H.264 video compression standard with Wi-Fi connect- connectivity. A judge at the U.S. International Trade Commission has ruled that the firm infringed four patents owned by Motorola Mobility. The full commission will review the judgment in August. If the final ruling goes against Microsoft and it does not settle, Motorola could theoretically force it all to halt imports of the Xbox to the U.S. Hmm. Dun, dun, really? Dun, dun. Wow. And then maybe <laughs> what? Just how the thought kind of died. <laughs> da, 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 da. And then silence. <laughs> All right, YouTube could battle. Oh, you could YouTube could face a huge bill for royalties after it lost a court battle in Germany over music videos. A court in Hamburg ruled that YouTube is responsible for the content that users post to the video sharing site. It wants the video site to install filters that spot when users try to post music clips whose rights are held by royalty collection groups Gemma. Gem- the German industry group said in court that YouTube has not done enough to stop copyrighted clips being posted. Gemma's court case was based on 12 separate music cl- clips posted to the website. The ruling concerns seven of the 12 clips. If YouTube is forced to pay royalties for all the clips used on the site, it will face a huge bill. If enforced, the ruling could also slow the rate at which video is posted on the site as any music clip would have to be cleared for copyright before being used. Mm. So if you want the full stories, go to Category 5 TV Newsroom. The Category 5 TV Newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions by our community of viewers. If you have any news story you think is worthy of on-air mention, email newsroom at category5.tv. From the Category 5 TV Newsroom, I'm Rachel Shu. Rachel, I thank you.
I got past the clouds. Got through the clouds. <laughs> got really nervous after that. The Just clouds. get through the clouds through and you'll clouds. be okay. Yes. All right. Hey, thanks also to Cordery Electric, the official electrical company of Category 5 Technology TV. Check them out at CorderyElectric.com. They service uh, the area of about, uh, you know, 100 kilometers radius of Barrie, Ontario. Also, GardengateFarms.com for certified organic broccoli sprout and wheatgrass juice. Visit them online, GardengateFarms.com. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Great to see you. Nice to have you here. Join us in the chat room. It's Category 5 on Freenode. Yay! Yay! So what other exciting stuff do you have well, for us today? We have lots to talk about, I mean, in the news. Speaking of billions of dollars, <laughs> there's Facebook and Instagram. I mean, Facebook, I mean, you saw it coming. They got lots of money. They're going to start buying stuff. You know? Asteroids. Instagram. It's bound to happen, right? Do you know what Instagram is? It's very cool. It was very cool. Instagram is an app for Android and iDevices, which allows you to basically use your mobile device as an old Lomo-style camera, like the you know pinhole camera or something like that, which is really, really cool. Now, it's, it's funny that technology has gone, okay, we need to have 1 billion megapixels, and then all of a sudden there's a new trend where it, needs to be as low quality as possible because it looks cool to have a camera that looks like it was from 1960. That's apparently the case. So Since when? Yeah. All right. Get in there. Mm-hmm. Where are you? Mm-hmm. There she is. Ah. Oh, you, did I get you? Uh. All right. That's a fantastic <laughs> shot. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Can we can we please retake that? <laughs> okay, let's try that again. I'm going to use the forward-facing camera, though, because that's a lot easier for us. I know that you, you like to see, but... All right, there you go. So this is taking a shot with Instagram. What's, what's unique about Instagram, Rachel, is that it allows you to take that photo now. As I'm saying, you can add effects that make it look like it's done with, you know, all these kind of crazy old cameras. So that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. The oh. issue is that, okay, they've gotten really, really big, but then Facebook bought them for $1 billion. I'm going to post this, by the way, on my Instagram account, so follow me on Twitter and you'll get to see this. Live on the air with, whew, posted to Twitter and Facebook. There you go. Done. So, with people's, I say I'm posting to Facebook too, but a lot of people are not Facebook fans, and that's because of the security issues, the the privacy issues that that are there on Facebook. Do you really want Facebook to now take your profile from Instagram now that they've been bought out by by Facebook? So, if you're uh, an Instagram user who uses it for Twitter but doesn't have a Facebook account, then the issue becomes, well, I don't want to be a part of Facebook's global uh, privacy scheme where they collect data and who knows what they do with it, but they certainly have had a few fumbles along the way. So, along come a bunch of services that are going to allow you to basically close down your account without losing your images. Here's the thing is that you don't want to lose all the images that you've posted because you've been working on your Instagram profile for some time and you've uploaded a lot of pictures. I use it for, you know, family pictures and things like that. Whenever I'm using my iPod, it gives a little bit of a a nice effect to the photos, more so than just taking them and posting them on Twitter or something like that. So Instaport is the one that I particularly liked. Instaport.com. M E. And here we go. So with this service, we're going to actually be able to download our entire Instagram account, all of our images, so that we can close down that account if we like. Or maybe we just want to use this as a backup. Hey, it's a great way to back up your photos because traditionally you don't really have access to your Instagram photos on your device and you're not going to go through downloading each one individually. That would just be a, a headache and a nightmare. So here we're going to go to instaport.me. There it is. 
We're going to click on sign in with Instagram that first time. Use your Instagram account. And then do you want to authorize this app? We're going to say yes. And here we go. So what do we want to do? Do we want to, that's all we want to do, download the zip file, advanced options, it's already defaulted to give me all of my photos, but say you've already done this, you only want, you know, the photos that were taken between date, you know, a date span, okay? So I'm just going to go all my photos and I'm going to hit start export. So that is going to actually kind of work in the background. I can close this website. I can keep doing my thing on the web, whatever I want to do. And lo and behold, couple minutes later depending on how the traffic is you're going to receive that zip file uh, if you've closed it you're going to receive an email if however um, you still have it up it's going to actually tell you that it's there and ready to go so here's my zip file it's up for me there it is so you can see that this is just a single zip file jam-packed with images how cool is that date stamps are gone so that's unfortunate but you know, who cares? That's just part of it. So when I click on one of those images, there it is. It's a full res 612 by 612 image, at least, of my baby boy. So now that I've done that, if you so choose, now you can use it as a backup service, or you can decide, okay, now that I've got my zip file, it's got all of my images, you've confirmed that, yep, it looks like all of those pictures are there. You can go through, make sure you're pleased. <laughs> and then you can close your Instagram account if you want because they are now owned by Facebook. So let us know what you choose. Let us know if that helps you out, whether you've used it as a backup or whether you've decided that, you know what, I'm not interested in having Instagram anymore that now, that, uh, now that Facebook owns it. We'd love to hear from you. Pop us an email live at category5.tv and let us know what you think. Yes. This is Category 5. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what do you think? I don't know what to think. You it's all in a different language. Is it? Is it it's like, gooly, 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 what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I throw that question at her. I should do it in between, you know, like while I'm in the middle of programming. What do you think of that, Rachel? Good. Or get Good a co-host who knows about computers. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would defeat the purpose. Cause, cause they're, they're Tell me more, Robbie, well, about this computer. <laughs> I think she's mocking me, folks. I'm pretty sure she's mocking me. Yeah. Klingon subtitles are in the works. Andrew Jameson is working on the translations right now. Uh, we appreciate Andrew for doing that. I know it's a lot of work. Um, the expletives especially, you know, having to null it down a little bit for a G-rated show, considering Klingon is nothing but expletives. Speak a line of Klingon. <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I got a question in the chat room last week, just after the show. And I thought, sometimes... I take for granted that maybe you already know about a lot of the cool services that are out there. I take for granted that if a website's down, I go to uh, down for everyone or just me.com. When I go there, I can check if the website is down for me or is it down for everyone? Is it down for everyone or just me.com? Uh, and then Garby says in the chat room, everybody, you got to remind me. Whatever it was that he needed a reminder for. I said, well, why don't you just future me it? And he said, what? Future me. Futureme.org. If ever you're in a situation where you think, well, I'd love to receive a note or maybe someone could give me a reminder, head on over to futureme.org. It's a fantastic service. It's freely available. All you need to do is enter your email address live at category5.tv. Put in a subject. Hello from the past. And then you're just going to enter an email just like you're writing it to, your, <laughs> to yourself. Hey, Robbie. Did you do that thing with that thing? That sounds wrong. Thanks. Oh, Rachel, you're <laughs> terrible. Terrible. <laughs> so do you use Did this you... all the time? Like, 
Hey, Didn't Robbie, you're looking good that. today. <laughs> yeah, I use it to encourage myself and boost myself up. Hey, Robbie, you look fantastic. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you can, you know, if that, if that makes you feel good, then go ahead, you know. Okay, did you program that computer that you were going to program, you dirty, dirty girl? All right, thanks from Robbie. Okay, so when do you want to deliver this email? It's going to go way into the future. I mean, it's defaulting to 2013. I can deliver it anytime I want. And I'll stand by this program because I know that this has been here for many, many years. Okay, honestly, who needs a reminder in 2031? I think it falls under the category of time capsule. I think it's like, you know, um, hey, hope you got that job promotion you were working on. Or, you know, you keep your chin up. Or It could be whatever. It could be encouragement to yourself. It could be a reminder that, hey, you know, because it doesn't have to be 2013. That was like, I got a letter from the government saying uh, I had to uh, send them an update in 2030. Oh, really? And I thought, why are they telling me now as if I'm going to remember in 2030 I'm May. supposed to send them this? Oh, dear. Yeah, that's <sighs> kind of crazy. Okay, May 1st, 2012. That's next Tuesday night. Uh, it's going to be delivered at any time during that. I'm going to say, hey, uh, have a great show, Robbie. All right. There's my future me message. Do I want to add a picture? Nah. Are you human? E-H-D-K-3. There we go. So now, with futureme.org, I'm ready to send that message into the future. Sent. Oh! Send date must be at least 30 days into the future. All right. Well, that's not so bad. Well, that's lame. Well, because what if you have something you want to do tomorrow or next week? I don't think it's really a calendaring system. Weeks. I think it's, it's emailing the future you. And so uh, thirty days makes sense. So let's let's just pick a Tuesday night uh, in more. So than if you get days. lonely in thirty days, you'll get a special little message yeah. from you. Okay, let's say June twenty sixth. All right, so everybody make note: June twenty sixth of this year. I'm going to receive that nice little message. It says, have a great show. All right? Am I human? And I'm surprised the date doesn't end days. after 2012. No, it goes all the way to 2062, because they're assuming that the Internet and the world is still going to be here. There we go. All right? Send to the future. Gone. The future says, thanks for the letter. That is very pleasant of the future to say. FutureMe.org. Hey, I, I know you've got ideas as to what you can use it for. Uh, I, I think it's fantastic. I've used it many, many times. It's just one of those things that you have in the back of your mind that when you need it, you know where it is. So Jot thinks you're going to have to send yourself another future message to remind you that a future message is coming. I'll send it in 28 <laughs> days. Yeah. By the way, a future message is on its way. Cool stuff. <laughs> on the topic of... Web services. We've looked at tinai.com before. Have you ever heard of that? Use that? Nope. Tinai was one of the first kind of popular reverse visual search engines. So it allows you to search images by images. So if you create or if you find an image, you can find a bigger copy of that image by basically comparing it against millions of other pictures on the internet. So let's see if I can find a picture that's reasonably popular. I'll grab like a, an Ubuntu screenshot or something along those lines. Let's maybe use that one. All right. So we'll save that to my desktop. Okay. So I've got an image now that is sitting on my desktop. There it is. Okay. So with TinEye, I can upload that image. And then TinEye is going to tell me all the places that it knows of where that image has been used, where I can get it in different resolutions, where I can find it on different, you know, different kind of layouts. If people have used it, there's 23 pages of websites that TinEye knows about that contains that particular image. I can say I want the biggest copy of that image, which happens to be 403 by, oh no, okay, my source image was 403 by 390 here. I found one that's a bit bigger, but it's, you know, it's got text around it, so that doesn't really count. Here's one, though, that's 503 pixels by 487, so it's actually a little bit bigger than the one that I want, or that I have, and so I might want to use that one because it's, it's a little bit bigger, higher res. Oh, it's not found on their server. 
but you get the idea of what 10i is, right? It's it's reverse image search. So then all of a sudden Google comes along and says, well, you know what, we're going to do a little bit of reverse image search ourselves, and they kind of one-up the uh, everything that's out there. And Google's good at this; they're good at one-upping. Let's pull do the zipper. I, do I really need to pull the zipper to lock this in? To, ooh. <laughs> Yay. Here's another one for you. Do a barrel roll. There you go. I didn't even get to type it because live search made it happen. Okay. Uh, so we're going to go Ubuntu. And I'm going to click on images. And let's find that same image. There it is. I'm going to drag that up and drop it where it says drop image here. And as simple as that, Google is now going to provide me with a search that is even more comprehensive for everywhere that that is found. And you can check by not just the image itself, but what about visually similar? You can find images that look kind of similar that have similar attributes, which is a fabulous way to say, okay, well, I've got an image of this you know, uh, like a nice field or something like that. I want to see if there's some images that are out there that are kind of similar to that. And you can find ones that are that are visually similar, which is kind of kind of wild and instantaneous. But again, with Google's uh, reverse image search, it's as simple as taking your image, dragging it up there, and dropping it. And that gives you your search. I'd encourage you to check it out, take a look, see how it works. It's one of those little tidbits that uh, is very, very useful when you're looking for high-res images. That's the other thing is, you know, always good to be able to find a higher resolution when you're working on stuff. You can click on more sizes. Here's the image in multiple different sizes. And you can see that it's sort of the biggest one at the very beginning. Jot wants to know what happens if you put a picture of yourself in Google Images. Well, it depends on whether you're, you're found out there or not. Like if I do Are you found, Robbie? Well, I am. Category 5. Yeah. Oh, uh, there you are. Doop. But if but if there's a visually similar image, it's it's, <laughs> it's going to find other images <laughs> that look You got the queen of hearts. Nice. <laughs> I look just <laughs> like that. I think that they're actually noticing the guy in the background on the left there. That's the guy. That's the guy. So those are visually similar images. And the reason, Jot, that those have come up instead of an actual bunch of, li like a list of a whole bunch of copies of that one picture is because that one picture is probably only in one or two places. It's not in too many places. There, I see a picture here that was taken for a news article. And I doubt, okay, so it looks like it's been used in many places, right? So, so that's just because somebody has maybe syndicated that, uh, that news article. So it works just the same way with any image that you find. Drag and drop. Really, really simple. So, cool stuff, eh? Cool beans. Yeah, any other questions in the chat room? Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left here. Not a lot of time, but uh, love to, love you to help got, you out if we can. Uh, more viewer questions here if you Jot want. Jot says he knew I was the queen of hearts. Aww. So nice. That Jot. He deserves to win a prize. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, great. Now I've got a nickname in the chat room. Thank you, folks. <laughs> I see the resemblance. <laughs> Do you want any of these? Yeah, no, I'm ready for you. Yeah. All right. So this guy says, I'm Bitcoin mining and have two systems set up to monitor the activity on one miner. Oh, I have. <laughs> I just heard Bitcoin mining and I'm thinking seven minutes to the show. Okay, read fast. I have open SSH server and screen on Lubuntu 11.04 64-bit right. UFW default settings on the computer I'm trying to monitor from Lubuntu 11.04 64-bit. I type SSH user at address and get connection timed out. I have tried to fiddle with the UFW rules on the box I'm trying to access, mm. but I'm not implementing them correctly and can't get SSH to access it. The only rules I want to change are those allowing me SSH access into the box. I want to monitor. I read man... UFW and have also UFW dash dash help but I still need some help. Cheers, Dan. Okay, Dan. If I follow you, I'm going to do my best. The first thing I would do, you've got a head on that server, I would hope, the one that you're SSHing into. Let's move this over here. Okay, so what I would do on that server, on that system, I would first go SSH localhost. Just like that. That's going to tell you if SSH is actually working. 
Now, on my in my case, it says connection refused. Now, you say that it says connection timed out, which is interesting. Are you using a script to connect instead of connecting manually, or what are you doing? Uh, as far as UFW goes, you'd go UFW allow SSH. For example, if SSH is the name of the service that you want to allow, hit enter on that. I need to be root, so I'll sudo that. Rules updated, right? So now SSH as a service is authorized through Uf, uh, UFW. That's the uh, the firewall. So, um, so in my case, I'm getting connect to localhost port 22 connection refused. So that most likely means I'm I don't have SSH server installed. App get install SSH. Uh, no, I want to go open SSH server. Yeah, see, I didn't have it installed. Open SSH dash server. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to install my SSH server into this box. You want to want to make sure that uh, that it's set up and running. So again, now I'm going to go SSH localhost, and it's going to ask you if the, if you want to trust this computer. I'm going to say yes, and now it's actually asking me for a password. So I know that. Yep. Okay, I'm working. So uh, because yours is saying that you're timing out, though. It's almost as if it's getting some form of a connection somewhere. So I would check your your physical firewall if that's the case. If there's something wrong with your routing, um, then check that out. Let us know, okay? Because I'd love to I'd love to help you. But that's uh, that's as far as I could probably go tonight, as as far as getting you connected. So good luck. Um, get into the uh, Ubuntu Lubuntu forums and and see if they'll help you there, uh, because some people you know people there will be able to bounce some ideas around and and interact with you uh, non real time like the show is real time but there you can post a message they can get back to you a day later kind of thing so a little bit easier for you so okay good luck Dan hope that helps so uh, we still got four minutes for some more Klingon speak <laughs> <laughs> what Klingon absolutely <laughs> curse. <laughs> it's not the only thing you know in Klingon. It's always the Is same. Is that what I said before? Yes. Yeah, no, so. <laughs> my my diction is is failing me. All right. Anyone D got that didn't take four minutes, but go kiss a tribble. Yeah. Go Akimoto <laughs> says. <laughs> I'll get one more. Agamoto, you're a goof, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's that's all the time that we got. Really, all. Hope you guys had fun tonight. You have fun. Don't uh, forget. All right. Uh, someone says Kiwi Tex has a. Oh, oh Kiwi yeah? Tex. Can I get a shout out to my daughter Brianna? She doesn't believe what is on television is live from another country. Hello, Brianna. Brianna, we are live from Canada. Woo! Canada. Hope you're tuning in. We had snow today, Brianna. Can you believe that? Snow. Snow. In spring. I'm wearing a sweater vest up here in Canada. And it's nice to have you watching. Thanks for yep. being here. Yeah. Well, that is uh, that is all the time that we have, but I encourage you to get your questions in through the week. I love to receive them live at Category5.tv. Don't forget to send in your postcards. I want to add yours to the growing pile and put them on our new website when that is launched. Also, don't forget to check out our mobile site, m.cat5.tv. You can access that just by scanning that code, beep beep, and you will be there. Check it out. What are you up to this week? Me? Anything exciting? No. I see you brought Timbits, so I know what we're doing. Yep. Timbits? We're, see, we're in Canada. 3D see glasses. That, you can't get those anywhere else. <laughs> You're missing out. At least here you can get them on every street corner. Ah, yes. yes. Fantastic, that Canada. Yeah. Well, hey, have a great week. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here. Yes, I had fun being here again. Yeah. Haven't been here a while. Yeah, it's, it seems like it's been a while. You were sick last time, so Eric came and filled in. Uh, the, the viewers caught on pretty quickly that it wasn't you, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, he's prettier than I am, so... <laughs> well, he is pretty gorgeous. <laughs> you know? But, uh... Yeah. Hope you have a great week. Mm -hmm. Don't forget cat5.tv slash eco. Very important. This is your last week to qualify, okay? And uh, we're going to look... We're going to talk to you next week. Very excited. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to have Erica 
not Eric, but Erica, back with us. Uh, and excited about that. And I'll talk to you next week. Rachel, we'll see you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.